right, so we'll um, we'll get started and kick off uh, our programming for this week. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, what uh, the programming is uh, attached to, um, and then Fran will introduce our wonderful guest who's beaming in live from across the pond uh, in Wales. Which is uh, as awful as this pandemic is, the one thing that I think is really um, uh, heartening and, and has been really great is the interconnectivity uh, and the ability to have these types of you know gatherings uh, that uh, we otherwise wouldn't the frequency that we used to do that uh, before when we could have live events um, uh, you know just didn't happen and now it happens regularly. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Amy Bowman McElhone. I'm the director and curator of the Carlo University Art Gallery in Pittsburgh. I'm also an art history professor there and um, overseeing the art program right now. Um, this, uh, every Friday we have virtual events uh, that is uh, in conjunction with our current exhibition, Anthropology of Motherhood and the Culture of Care. And the exhibition, uh, uh, the project is an ongoing project that uh, Fran founded. Um, and it's now in its, uh, I think, sixth iteration. Um, and so I, I was lucky enough to be invited this year to co-curate it with her. Um, so it was originally uh, curated for the Three Rivers Arts Festival, and that's where it's been held the past few years. And it's a really radical show that centers caregiving uh, centers motherhood is 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 um, looking at uh, maternal feminisms and the the unique part about it uh, in its in its initial sort of iterations was that it combined um, a nursing space a space of respite with an exhibition space these things that are usually um, these spaces that are usually separate and segregated uh, become one. Uh, and so with this version of the show, we were able to, we had to do it digitally, a, a digitally native show this year because of the pandemic for Three Rivers Arts Festival, but we were able to bring uh, the artworks to the Carlo University Art Gallery uh, to have the physical show, albeit without the nursing uh, and, and the space of um, care uh, that uh, is usually associated with it. And I want to point out that Sue Powers is with us today and she's one of the artists. So thanks for joining us, Sue. <laughs> um, but the, the, this iteration of the exhibition uh, really expanded upon the notion of motherhood into this broader definition of caregiving. And this is particularly important and relevant right now, given the moment that we are living through. But I, beyond that, it is important generally. And many times the, the work of caregivers and the work of mothers and the work of parents and the work of uh, uh, people that uh, just as their profession and as, as, their, um, as their calling is about the care of others is usually uh, invisible work. It's usually um, uh, not valued. And uh, the, the primary objective of this exhibition is really to value it, to raise it up, to elevate it, to, de to not only um, uh, uh, you know, proclaim and um, uh, provide a platform for the work, but also to, to um, really unpack the, the art, the artfulness of it all. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna throw it to Fran. And so anyways, we have a whole series of programs that uh, intersect with the, these broader ideas of care. Um, and so with that, I'll throw it to Fran. Uh, to introduce our guest tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Welcome, everyone. So glad to see everyone here with us today. Um, I, uh, I, I have a very personal introduction to give to this, our, our esteemed guest right now, Miss Ruth Fabi. She's an incredible human being, great friend. Hold on, I gonna let some people in. Um, oh, <laughs> um, uh one of the most important cultural producers in disability arts in the uk and i would argue in the world um sh don't don't shake your head at me ruth <laughs> <laughs> um and a, a dear dear friend uh, ruth has been um a, a, one of the 
greatest advocates for disability and disability arts that I have met. She is a mentor, an incredible mentor and an incredible friend to me. Um, and I am very, very happy to have her and share her with all of you. Um, so without further ado, I present the current director of Disability Arts. Uri. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you here. And thank you for coming out on a Friday, because it's usually Friday we start to wind down for the weekend and whatever. First of all, can you hear me? OK. And can you follow my wonderful accent? OK. Yes. Right. <laughs> I um, was going to do a workshop around disability arts as a tool for empowerment, purely on that. And then when I saw the theme of um, motherhood and all the great pieces of work that are going on, I thought, I'm going to investigate how to put this into the context of what this whole um, sessions, um, the series of works been about. So I found a lot of discoveries and I want to be able to share them with you and ask you to ask questions about all this as we go through the presentation I've got. I just want to be clear, is there anyone who's got any access requirements? You're okay, no one needs me to describe any of the images. You have, but no. you can hear me through your Bluetooth thing, can't yes, you? Yes, I do not need you to transcribe any images for me, thank you. I normally have a transcriber working with me, but I couldn't get anyone because it's now 20 to 10 at night for me here and no one was going to work that late for me. I thought I'd really won that one, but anyway. So that means I'm not going to hear your questions that well. Um, I mean, if we stay quite tight, I'll be able to put your face up and um, watch and ping you. I don't know if you're that familiar with the Zoom protocols. Um, one thing that um, I've just been asked to remind you of is this has been recorded. So if you don't want your face to be seen, please put your camera off. Um, uh, Fran wants to keep a record of all of this stuff that's going on. Um, I will be asking you to use the chat, if that's okay, as a little tool we go through. I've got one real exercise, but any questions that come up, if you don't mind putting them in the chat, because it'll keep the flow and it'll be helping my access requirement. Is that all right? I'm really hoping you're going to enjoy this and I really want you to dissect it, ask anything you want. I'm going to expose my heart to you as a disabled person and a mother. Um, and I just realised there's no images of my children in this talk, which is very unusual for me. But then again, I, just, I don't need to always have my identity made by them, which can be something that we fall into a trap being. OK, so I'm going to share the screen and start off with a PowerPoint presentation. Um, if you want to close your eyes for a minute, because it's not going to be full screen, and I want to hide some of the images I'm going to present. So close your eyes for a minute. I'll tell you when you can open them. OK, don't open them yet. Um, come on, where's the, the size show? The thing's over it. That's why I'm not seeing it. Don't open your eyes yet. Come on. Yay, you can open your eyes now. OK, you got. These are my names. I have now Ruth Fabby. I was a Ruth Gould and I used to be a hare. Um, so I only got married last October. Unexpectedly fell in love after a long, long marriage where I had my three children and someone who had just given up on life, really. And I tried for over 20 years to make that work. But I went from being a hare, which is a sign for her, to a gold, and now I've got an extra syllable. I'm a fabby, and I love being a roof fabby because I'm fab. It's fantastic, and my lovely husband is absolutely amazing. I'm going to give you some images of me throughout my life, okay? This is me when I started doing my artwork. I can't believe I, I had a neck. But anyway, has our lives changed? It's quite phenomenal. But one of the things I was so insecure as a child quite a lot of abuse in my background through my mother of all things but it's fine because I've learned to forgive and move on but when I had my first child it started my activism I'm going to show you a picture of just as he was born and um, the umbilical cord is still attached I don't know if you can see that and that's Alex oh it says free meeting, we're going to end. Um, is that a problem? You've got your mic up. Will it cut us off? 
Are you going to be all right? It, I'll keep going. Uh, if we get, well, uh, I'm just worried because I know Zoom, you have a free 40 minutes. If you haven't, are you going to be okay? Is this going to be all right? Fan, do you want to take your mic off? I'm just not right sure we're going to okay. be okay. Um, Sarah, can you figure out why are we going, why are we? Um, on a free one. Yeah, is we're not in a free one. This is definitely a paid subscription. I mean, okay. But you just keep you do that in the background. I'll keep going. If it looks yeah. like we've got a problem, we may need to come out and get another um, Zoom. I've got a Zoom account, so I can put it on mine. But anyway, having my child was the pivotal moment that made me start to believe I could live. I had a right to be alive. Um, one of the biggest things that happened to me when I was 16 weeks pregnant with him, I went to see my obstetrician for the first time and he looked through my notes and um, it was quite intimidating. He had a lot of student doctors around him, some nurses. So as a 22 year old, it was really quite worrying to be in that environment. He examined me, uh, yeah, your baby is at that time. And um, they looked at my notes and went, oh, I see you have hereditary deafness within your family. I think you'd be highly irresponsible to continue with the pregnancy. It shocked the life out of me. And I, I was a mouse. I didn't really say anything. I was looking at him and for something from me, which was like a core, almost a lioness sort of comment came out, which I would never have done in my life before then. I just went, well, I'm deaf and I don't think you should have killed me. And he was really taken aback by that. And I had quite a horrible time with the rest of the pregnancy. But I wanted this child. I got into the whole thing about a natural birth, no drugs, have the umbilical cord still attached and not cut straight away. All the things that are standard now. But back then in 1981, I was a bolshy, hippie, pain in the arse to them. Ooh, can I swear in this format? Is that all right? Yes, we hope you will. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, there's me on my wedding day last year. I'm really excited to be married. I'm living in a new country, a new challenge with a new organisation. And my life has moved on. I've had two more children after Alex, who you can see in that picture. Um, I managed to get my master's. Um, I didn't have a first degree. Um, so I was quite um, pleased with myself to be able to get that. That's my son standing next to, to me. Um, he, he's now 39. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter how life goes on, but here's me in another um, rendition of my life. So I've tried to show you different stages of my life. I'm very overweight there because I've just come out of hospital after being told I didn't have long to live. I've got a lung disease. I'm, I'm all swollen with the steroids. That's me and my oxygen. And I'm actually doing a sign dance performance to I will survive. And it went down really well. But um, I really like to use and experience the things I go through to the max. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I just wanted us to think about disability and motherhood and disabled people being mothers. That shocked me to my core when I was pregnant and got told I'd be irresponsible to continue the pregnancy. I also had another child when I was 40. And again, I was told, get it tested. You can't have it if it's got Down syndrome. And it shocked me what the messages are out there. Um, I'm just seeing the pictures here. I'm uh, just covering now, I'll keep moving it. Um, women are more likely than men to become disabled during their lives due to part, in part to gender bias in the allocation of scarce resources and in access to services. So women in disability, approximately 300 million women around the world have mental and physical disabilities. Women constitute 75% of the disabled people in low and middle income countries. Women with disabilities comprise 10% of all women worldwide. Now we're not representative when it comes to jobs, places of authority and in being mothers. I, um, oops, I think I may have missed something there. Oh no, I haven't. Okay. 
this is the image we're, we're kind of, if any of us have done the arts, would know very well. Um, the Beggars by Sir, uh, Peter Bruggle, the, a, the Elder. Disability has been around since the start of mankind being on this planet. Sorry, that was the wrong humankind. Sorry, the feminist slipped from me then. Um, so we need to just have a look at our history. So I'm going to give you a little talk on to make me call a social model. Um, Ruth, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for one second because we are trying to figure out how to um, extend this meeting. If we are all all of a sudden cut off, please just just hang tight. We will send you another Zoom link. Um, right, we're, so we can be able to carry it on with it. You don't want me to give you my Zoom link? Um, I, I um, we'll figure that out in a little bit. I think that um, we should. We should should be able to do this. <laughs> this is fun. Okay, so, All right. I'll leave it to you and but, I'll carry on. Yeah, I, it, the thing is, is I made you the co-host now, Ruth. So if you're on your Zoom account with um, Disability Arts, it might not shut down. Um, this, you, you want me to try it again, did you say? No? No. Not, don't, sorry, do you want to put something in the chat to me? It's... It's still working. Do you want me to carry on? Sorry about this. Yes, please carry on. So I can carry on with my PowerPoint, yep. Okay. Do you know, my PowerPoint wasn't that good because it missed a very important slide out. And that was my intro slide. I'm gonna just put this up. Um, Cause I wanted you to see, oh no, it's gone on to the next one. All right, I'm gonna move you. Okay. I want disability arts. There's a talk, a tool for empowerment. And this is me, how I describe myself, apart from the fact I am also a disability agitator, activist, artist, programmer, etc. But I want to, to talk to you today on this disability arts tool for empowerment from a disabled, deaf, neurodivergent, long-term chronically ill mother's observations so that's what the talk of this is all about i'm going to get back to the um the, the <sighs> i thought i had it all sorted with the powerpoint but obviously i didn't practice well enough so we're up to peter Bruegel and the impression we have of disabled people around up to the start of the industrial revolution disability was part and parcel of community we still see that in some of the more the, the the less uh, wealthy countries around the world where disability is just embraced as part of, that's what happens, we're, we're used to it. We're, the research that's going on in, in the UK now is showing up to 80% of communities were disabled back up to the in industrial revolution. There's so many of us have been around for so long, but you wouldn't think it because of the world we live in today. Okay, I just wanted to share this brilliant image of a, I think she's a Filipino lady with a, um, a baby. So disabled people can be mums. If I move this, is that okay for you? Yeah, I'll put it on the bottom. This is a US statistics I found around disability and mother, uh, motherhood. Around 36 million women in the US have disabilities and the number is growing. About 44% of those aged over 60 years or older are living with a disability. And researchers show that this grows with every year you get older. So there is a notion that you're either disabled or you're not disabled yet, because if you live long enough, you will become disabled. The most common cause of disability for women is arthritis or rheumatism. And I wonder whether that's got something to do with what we have to lift around our lives, carry around our lives, etc. It's a really interesting fact that could be unpicked. Um, but disabled deaf women are everywhere and we don't see them really being celebrated that much. We don't see it as a normal thing, an ordinary everyday thing. And I wonder why that is. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this sheet. I'm aware there's some um, mistakes in it. So forgive me for that. But my friends who are wheelchair users, where it's an obvious impairment, they get all sorts of stuff put into their lives. Um, you know, you're too pretty to be in a wheelchair. Do you need help? You're a little. And I, I just want to be able to 
have a little talk around the room, put things in the chat, if that's right, the labels that you think identify who you are. Okay, so we've got the chat open. So start putting labels in. Anything that you feel from a disability perspective or just from a woman's perspective, what are the labels that are around? What are the phrases that go with your life? Anyone got anything? I'll read them out when you say, sorry, I can't get you to shout them out. I'm probably gonna get them wrong if I do that. So I, I can be called the mouthy scouser. The Liverpool people get called scousers because of a stew that comes from Norway. Anybody else got anything? Oh, here we go. Right, aggressive, oh, interesting. Asian American, Korean American woman. Woman, artist, empath, femme, white, queer, great. Any other things? Anything around disability in there? Four eyes, what's wrong with you? Ugly? That's awful. No, oh, I don't know what CPTSD is. You are not deaf because you speak, of course. Yeah, I have that with my hearing dog. You speak, how can you have that? You're not deaf stupid yeah it's horrible how how often that we can be called those things ah complex post oh gosh i'm sorry about that that's hard um but is there are those things what really are your identify the things that identify you i want you to put something really positive a phrase or a word that really is you what's in here about you that you know is true about you introvert Optimistic. Any other? Resilient. That's a great one. Growing. Yeah. Yeah. Survivor. Some really empowering words there. Right. I'm going to go back into the share screen and we're going to go back into um, looking at some of the, the other things about, about words and identity. One of the problems around disability is your impairments, hold on, it's a bit slow, often can actually determine who you are, uh, how people see you. Here's a woman that we used to work with, um, she, she's now passed on, um, a wheelchair user. And this is what people would say about her when they saw her performing. Oh, it's triumph over tragedy. Then that's something that's uh, common within America. Brave, courageous, special amazing well why do we do that around disability why can't we just um ordinary because what you often get and i don't think this lady was the case is um they can be awful but we still go oh because they're standing in front of people or singing in front of people we don't say the truth we over patronize or we do things which are not really going to help so in the chat i want you to write out any words or phrases you know about disability now, things you may have heard in the playground, things I hope haven't been said to you, but that we did have a four eyes there before, which is awful. But I want you to write in the chat any phrases uh, uh, that you think of around disability. I always ask people to sort of get the demons out when we do this. Differently abled, that's an interesting one. Is that something common in America? Yep. Yeah. Deaf and dumb. Really? Still deaf and dumb? Mm. Yeah, people would actually, our law, our Disability Discrimination Act, can actually take you to court for injury to feeling. And that includes the terms you use. Retarded. That's a really big one, that. Yeah. I, um, I was thought of as retarded until I got to the age of six. And the teacher suddenly went, oh, I think she's deaf. Don't think there's a learning difficulty there. Um, and sure enough, that's, that's when I got my, my hearing aids. I wasn't there. But those terms can really take over your life and determine how people feel about you. And we need to actually look at things that can stop that disempowering, dehumanizing that these phrases do. So why don't we see disabled people and automatically think, oh, wife, mother, translator, folk singer, friend 
translate is a big thing where I live now in Wales because we're really trying to reclaim the Welsh. Um, Welsh is a traditional language for Britain and when we got the Anglo-Saxons invading us the Welsh were pushed into the farthest reaches of the land and it's been there for thousands of years really in the way it's developed but it was barred up until about the 1950s, 1960s. And um, if children were caught speaking Welsh in school, they'd have a board put over them with WN on it, Welsh not. So there's a lot of reclaiming the language now in Wales, which is very akin to disability and deaf culture, how identities have been really mucked around with and stopped. I'm having to use that thing on there, I'm afraid, because my computer's not working properly. Oh, I hate doing that. So sorry. So I want to give you a little quick history here. From the earliest of ages, um, uh, uh, records have showed that societies often treated disabled people as outcasts or curs. Aristotle, the Greek founding father around education, etc., said, get rid of imperfect children. Ancient Romans would throw disabled um, children under horses' hooves, have blind gladiators fight each other, and even have dwarves fight women. Yet disabled people have always been around due to disease and lack of medical intervention. And most of the time we're accepted as part of a wider family unit until we got sat things of social upheaval, pestilence and plague, when they're often made scapegoats or evil people being disastered on, on others. I could go into the history of that, we haven't got time, but it's fascinating when you start to, to look at it. But we see disabled people prevalent throughout art. Um, there is a thing of having people with restricted growth in a lot of the courts across Europe, particularly. Um, there's a couple more all of these are by Velasquez, which is quite interesting. I wonder why he really was focusing on this. So we know disability has been around, but we there was a change in terms of disabled people just being part of communities so suddenly being identified and labelled by what they had, as people would put it, wrong with them. So we think the Industrial Revolution, disabled people began to be institutionalised because they could no longer, but they couldn't be seen as being productive in the way the mass industrialization was taking over society. So for the first time, we had institutions being set up based on impairment, blind, deaf, crippled, usually led by the nice caregivers within society, often through church, um, which is hard. Oops. With the Enlightenment, a more scientific understanding was created about the causes of impairment. So people started to experiment on disabled people in these institutions and we get a lot of horror stories about actually what went on. It led to an increase in confidence in being able to cure or at least rehabilitate disabled people. But what was really interesting about this time, the 1800s, the eugenics movement grew in strength in the wake of Darwin's theory of evolution. Survival of the fittest. Um, Mary Dendy broke the mould as a woman educator in the late 1800s in uh, the UK, but she was an advent uh, eugenicist and in uh, 1890 said that children classes mentally handicapped should be, this is horrible, detained for the whole of their lives as the only way to stem the great evil of feeble mindedness in our country. So this thinking was coming on right across the um, the, the world really in terms of how disabled people with an industrialization starting to be a problem and we we get these sort of adverts are very much part of that history i'm trying to put you in, you in a way where you could actually I'll put you up there that's i mean when i'm moving you can you see me moving you or you're in the same place because i want to make you, you're just in the same place Okay, forget what I'm saying then. I've got your pictures and I'm moving them around so I can see the pictures thinking it's blocking you. So sorry about that. Okay, this is an advert that was um, quite well known in Britain um, 25 years ago. It was to raise funds for the research into motor neuron disease. And it's horrendous. As a mother, it's horrendous to read this. And I, I find it hard to still read it, even though I've been training on it for over 20 years without coming to tears. But imagine your muscles have wasted away, but your mind is still active. You can't move. You have to be dressed and fed and you can't even talk. Katie's mum has motor neuron disease. Now Katie has a real doll to look after. 
It's horrendous. It's dehumanizing. It's saying you're trapped with an active mind and a body, but your child's got to look after you. It's putting all the horrors there with the way it's using the graphic of a, a doll, not even human, black and white spotlight on. They never show someone like um, Stephen Hawking who had this disease what he accomplished, or other women who've had this disease, they always paint the worst case scenario with this disease. And that's very much what the charity has done. We call all this the medical model of disability. Um, oh, oh, sorry about this. I've just gone, yeah. Um, where the individual is a problem in society, impairments, chronic illness are the real difficulties and it's caused by what's wrong with you and how your body doesn't work and it's all a negative. But we've got a new thing that we work in with disability arts called the social model of disability. You may already know this, I'm sorry if I'm going over old ground with some of you, but we say society disables us. Society puts the barriers in that stops us having the same opportunities as other people. Um, I'm not sure if any in the room have had impairments as children, but often I was, go to a deaf school, you're not able to be educated. That was the whole message. My mum wouldn't let that happen because I don't really think she was that bothered about me and um, about my own education development. It was more she couldn't cope with the stigma of it. She was embarrassed and didn't want a deaf child, or even though she became a hearing aid wearer herself as she got older. So we need to actually look at those sorts of structures, that thinking in society, which stops many disabled people really knowing they are not the problem, that we have systemic institutionalization and issues that stop us take playing a full part. Um, I love this picture of a mother with joy with her disabled young son. We don't see enough of them. If we do, they're using documentaries or what. There's another one. My son, who is older, I breastfed for about 18 months. A deaf woman talking about what she did as a mother. People don't want to hear about this. You're not supposed to have children if you're deaf or disabled. A mother pushing her baby in her wheelchair with a baby at the front of a wheelchair, an adapted wheelchair, so she can be a full mum. It's lovely to see these images, but we hear so many horror stories of disabled women and being told they're not fit mothers, people having people, to, their babies taken off them. One of my closest friends is um, blind and she was in a park with her guide dog, a brand new baby in a pram and a toddler. Now, most blind people can have some sort of sight so she can walk and, and get around um, uh, quite independently with her dog. And um, two women went past her, very loudly spoken, going, oh, what a shame for those poor two kids. And they're terrible. She's her, their mother. I mean, awful things, but said very publicly. We've got to look at some, dis uh, some role models. And one of the earliest role models, I think everyone, every woman who's in the arts loves Frida Kahlo. So I thought I'd just put some interesting quotes there about how she felt about her impairments. I'm assuming you know about her, so I'm not going to talk more about her. Um, but I love this because it actually puts it into perspective about how we live with our broken bodies. There have been two great accidents in my life. One was the trolley and the other was Diego. Diego was by far the worst. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Um, but her impairment, she accepted it. I paint my own reality. The only thing I know is that I paint because I need to. And I paint whatever passes through my head without any other consideration. She's an artist and she painted about herself and the things that were important to her life. And I felt this last quote, painting completed my life. And here's some pieces of work about because she wasn't a mother, but she tried to be a mother. She had a number of miscarriages and she has painted some images about her uh, lost children. Um, and this is one. But other things that she does really just says it in her art. And I've got a few images I just want to show. The things she had to deal with, the, uh, a corset, uh, multiple operations, uh, times she couldn't lay out of bed. Um, it's great. Back here in the 1930s, 40s, she was pushing herself in a wheelchair picture. A lot of people would have tried to show no, I will not accept that. I will show them how fit and healthy I am. She was showing truth. I'm so brave. And I, 
I love this image where she's got breast milk coming out of a woman's uh, breast and Diego that is is like a child and it, it is it says so much about what was going on with the woman so to me though we don't say it's disability art it was the start of it and she's influenced people so much but disability arts the tool for empowerment and I'm going to try and whiz through it so I don't lose you too much with the time it's not that long I know but you've seen this nothing about us without us it's a big mantra that the UK picked up from America when you started to do your big marches for disability rights and we picked up onto that in a big way but disability arts was something that came from the protest in terms of people articulating pictures like this to make a point about our lives. Firstly, our voices need to be heard and you shouldn't be doing anything without talking to us. That is the consequence of the medical model. Everything was done to us. And this is someone taking that very iconic image into a disability arts um, image, the disability arts movement. We demand rights, not charity. They're doing a lot of protests. Um, I love you've got photographers, painters, um, people. The trouble with normal people is they don't exist. And that is so true. We, we're not really, it's not really normal. We're all different. Okay, so definition of disability arts. Are you all okay? You want to give me a thumbs up? Yeah, I'm not making you fall asleep or anything. I'm hoping this is interesting, but we're getting to the juicy bits in a moment. Disability art or the arts is, or disability arts is any art, theatre, fine arts, film, writing, music, or club that takes disability as its theme or whose context relates to disability. So disability can affect anybody, but there are some diehard um, activists who will say disability arts is a concept which was developed out of the disability arts movement. In the disability arts movement, disability arts stood for art made by disabled people, which reflects the experience of disability. To make disability art in the disability arts movement is conditional on being a disabled person. As I've been working in the sector for nearly 30 years, I actually think it's moving on because more and people, uh, more and more people are starting to attune to disability arts. So I'm going to give you some examples of women I know have done great disability arts. Susan Austin, creating a spectacle. As a wheelchair user, she was fed up with how people used to speak to her and not see her as someone who was sexy and energetic and free. So she's managed to create an underwater wheelchair um, contraption um, where she's been able to go, this was in the Dead Sea, get these amazing images talk, um, taken about her work. She has now developed a contraption which is allowing her to fly in a wheelchair. She's got wings on it and it actually is flying. It's quite scary, but she's determined to pervert how people see her as a disabled woman. And I think that to me is the crux of what we can do in disability arts, how it can empower us as women. Here's another image of someone who's a dear friend. I don't know if um, you ever had these in America, but we had them a lot. You can't quite see this, but it was to help the spastic society. We used to have the spastic society and um, there were these little creatures or guide dogs for blind people. Um, outside this with a slot in the head for you to put money in. Here's Catherine Aranello, a disabled woman who is, well, sadly she died last year. She's someone I programmed a lot in Dada Best. She was just absolutely awesome amazing in how she challenged the perceptions of how she saw herself as a disabled woman. She did a lot of video films. So if you look it up, you, you'll see all this great of how she's subverting time and time again, how people view her. But as I was looking at these, I was like, where are the women in motherhood? I'm just going to show you two more. Tanya Rabi, um, a great portrait painter. She's now got her work in um, Trafalgar Square and the National Portrait Gallery. She's actually done pictures of so many disabled people across the UK. And this is another woman, Deborah Williams, who she's painted. She's not doing that one here, obviously. I'm just put two pictures together. Deborah Williams, um, I commissioned her to do a programme on, uh, a performance on the life of Harriet Tubman um, about 15 years ago. I just honoured her because it's actually Disability Month in um, 
the UK. I don't know if you've got that being celebrated here, but I, I nominated her and she wrote back and said, I was one of two people who commissioned her to do a piece of performance. Um, it just broke my heart because there's an issue around black women as well. So there's lots of issues and complexities about us being women. Um, this, I don't know if you've come across Liz Carr. Um, I'm very proud of Liz because she did the very first drama course with the organisation I used to run. And then I debuted at the very first festival I put together in 2001. And she's just gone on to do the most incredible work. And um, this one in the middle, she did Su a Sister Suicide, the musical. And the fact that people think us as disabled people just want to die. Our lives are so not worth living. Just take us to the exit and let our life be over. It's shocking what she came up with, but she agreed it's one of her best pieces of work that she's ever done. Um, even though she's been in quite a lot of American films of late, she's really getting quite well known. Um, but this is probably one of the most famous of women a motherhood in disability arts. And the irony is the sculptor is not disabled. It was Mark Quinn. But on in Trafalgar Square, we've got all these monuments of these men, half of them, we haven't a clue who they are, but there's an empty plinth. And what they do is they allow people to put art on it. And Alison Lapper was done as a marble statue by Mark Quinn. It's about 15, 20 foot high, and it's her pregnant. Beautiful image. The outcry, of course, in the UK was phenomenal from very well known people saying it's disgusting, it's a monstrosity. We don't want to see a disabled person on the plinth. Yet, if you look up here, that's Nelson. He had one eye, one leg, and one arm, but they wouldn't think of him as disabled. What is it that people go on about with these things? This is Paris, who was a beautiful little boy, and I actually worked with her. We, um, Mark put the a statue to a small, um, about six foot high. We had it in an exhibition in Liverpool um, two years after Dada Fest first launched. And um, we had it in the Victorian room with all these incredible statues of Victorian gods looking beautiful with all these pictures, um, sculptures of disabled people. And the contrast was amazing. So I met Paris, he was lovely. And, and this is gonna get you because it gets me. Last year, Paris killed himself. And when it went through the news, he was just totally bullied for having a disabled mum. And that has just broken a lot of people because she was a brilliant role model. The pictures you see of them together as he grew up, beautiful. He's always laughing, always, you know. But when he got to his, his middle, well, early teens, he just started to lose it. He used to beg her not to come into parents' night because he'd get so abused by his friends. So we've got some big issues there about how disabled women are seen in public, about also our roles as mums. Is another mum. I was really trying to think of mums. And she's, this is brilliant, it's Liz Bentley. And she's done this mask, the coronavirus mask. So she's played on the coronavirus. The mask thing is a big issue. She is just a prolific writer, performer. She plays a ukulele as well. I've had her doing lots of work for me over the past, but she writes real to the heart stuff about women and what women go through. And I thought I'd just get a bit of her writing because I thought this was really interesting to look at. International Women's Day on the 8th always brings up difficult stuff for me because my dad wanted me to be a boy big issue for some of us. My sister would have been called John Winston. So I guess I would have been called John Winston. But if she had been a boy, I would be marked something. When I used to work at Marie Stokes abortion clinics, women came from all over the world, nearly at that 24 week mark. It is still a tragedy to have a girl in many parts of the world. You know, she's seen raw life as a woman and she's not afraid to say it. But these big questions, we need to ask them and what is it that happens to us as women? Um, I'll, I'll keep the focus around disability in this. This is a quote from a UN paper. I'll put a, pa a document together with all these links on so you can have a good look at them. Women are expected to aspire to norms of femininity that include ideal motherhood, where mothers are positioned as ever available, ever nurturing providers of active, involved and expert mothering. Indeed, being a caregiver is a master status for adult women in modernity. While this may be the case for all women, mothers who are disabled can have more complicated relationships to the ideal motherhood than others. 
because they are perceived as either asexual and inappropriate to the role of motherhood or conversely because they are seen as sexually victimised and at risk. This comes from a paper by Claudia Malacrida, Performing Motherhood in the Disabled World. I see documents, I see papers, I don't see the art. We're missing, there's something there that doesn't allow disabled women to really make work from their perspective. There is also a perspective I've seen, a commonality of people talking about mummy issues. I've got hundreds of mummy issues, but a lot of people make art about him. And this is, um, you may know Terry Galloway and Donna Nudd, they're based in um, Tallahassee. Um, um, they both set up the house, um, the Mickey Faust Club. Uh, their work is phenomenal. I brought them together um, in uh, Liverpool twice to work on this piece of drama. And that was just a clip of them um, talking about it, but this is what it was about. It featured Liz Carr, Trudy McNamara, and three American women and one American man. Um, this is Terry Galloway. Um, she's a deaf woman who got a cochlear implant and did a piece of work on what it meant to have a cochlear implant. But they did a piece of work on what is, um, you may be familiar with this, the ugly laws uh, that were around in America in some states that if you were disabled, you were not allowed to be out in public. So they created a piece of burlesque show called The Ugly Girl in 2014. And here's a quote from it. The, psycho, the psychotic surreal musical is played out by a dysfunctional family in front of the corpse of their dead mother. I was a dead mother. I, I was writing a play. I had to come in and just go, I fucking found it. I fucking found it. And then I have a heart attack and die. And I'm just there the whole time they did this play. It was great fun. Um, but um, it included a common mix of melodrama, Punch and Judy, vaudeville and English musical, writer and performer, Terry Galloway, deaf since nine, recently received a cochlear implant. The first minutes after implant, all she could hear was a frightening cacophony. It made me want to tear my head off. I was terrified until my audiologist picked up on a child's toy, a bell, that when she rang it made a piercingly joyful trill. My brain seemed to turn round in my skull and fasten on that sound. And when it did, I came to two realisations. I was going to love hearing and I was going to write a musical. And so she has. The thing about cochlear implants, they're not, they're not, um, they're just another human aid. You're not completely cured. And a lot of people think things like that does that happen to people. But women writing about their lived experience of disability, we see things like that happening. I love this mummy image, you know, fighting over your baby. Um, it's, um, but that's what we seem to get, those sorts of stories. We don't see the beautiful stories that many of us as disabled people can have. Um, this I want you to think about because it really gets me. It's a Down syndrome mum and it's beautiful. But most people with learning disabilities in the UK, it's something like 69% have their child taken off them at birth. They can do nothing about it. They're not allowed to be mothers. They're not allowed to be taught to be mothers. Um, some people, their mothers and fathers will get the sterilization order on them. We have a real problem here. And this piece I'm gonna talk about now is probably the most poignant piece of motherhood I've ever seen. And it came from the learning disability community. It's called Mia, Daughters of Fortune from Minor Gap Theatre Company. Um, it's a beautiful play about being a mum, being a parent and learning disabled. I like the fact that Minor Gap like to ask people what they think about their stories. Um, how did it make you feel? The show made me open up on a subject that was very personal to me. It made me laugh and cry at the same time. And it hit a note that hasn't been hit before. Parenthood is a delicate subject, especially for people with a learning disability. I want to show you a little film now. Um, so I'm going to stop the show I get on. That gives you a bit of explanation about that story. Um, Oh, no, I just want to reduce this a bit so I can get into it. Um, and I think you'll find it really fascinating, actually. And so it's only just over two minutes long. Well, you're right for time. It's just on 30 and it's my last thing, really. Is that OK, everybody? I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, where is it? Oh, I need to actually... I'm going to take that out. Hold on. Take that out. Put that up. Here we go. 
Are you actually all seeing this? Hello, my name is Ling Ah Yu. Please call me Joyce. I'm the director of Mia. I remember last year, one of the artists told me about、uh, a story of her sister, who's also got lung disability, going through pregnancy、Sorry. and、uh, parenthood. The stories really opened my eye because、Just、I realized that there are lots、I've、of hurdles that. Just bear with me. I've done it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get this、um, on the full screen. On、um, oh, it's so hard to do. <laughs> sorry. You're just gonna have to see me do it really badly. Okay. Where have you gone? Okay. There we go. Hello, my name is Ling Ah Yu. Please call me Joyce. I'm the director of Mia. I remember last year, one of the artists told me about、um, a story of her sister, who's also got lung disability, going through pregnancy and、uh, parenthood. The stories really opened my eye because I realized that there are lots of hurdles that this woman and the family needs to go through that non-disabled people don't have to. I am also thinking about being a mother, and. This is difficult decision for me to make already. By creating Mia, I would like to tackle this issue of learning disabled people's parenthood head on, rather than beating around the bushes. Hey, my name is Anna Gray. I mean, I've been at Mia for five years now, and it's my first natural drawing of Mia. I think Mia is important because it. Just give some insight into the challenges learning disabled parents can face, which most parents, not being disabled in the first place, wouldn't even know. Ruth, Ruth, yes.、Yeah. We still can't see the film. Oh、really、no! Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's <laughs> okay. You can't see it at all. Now, what we see is your、uh, slideshow, but it's not in. Presentation mode. It's still in the、um, the、okay. individual slide mode. Oh dear! Did you hear? Did you hear any of it? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Did you hear any of it? Yeah. So you just didn't see it. So are you all right for time? I just start again. I'll start it from where it is. I'm just worried about your time. You okay? I'll share the screen. Put it back on to the beginning. Then let me. Oh, There we go. Can you see it? Yes. Can you see it? Yes. So Mia is the、okay. fast moving. Okay. I'll take it back. Okay.、Tom. Is this okay? Yes. Rejoice. It's all right. I'm the director of Mia. I remember last year, one of the artists told me about、um, a story of her sister, who's also got lung disability, going through pregnancy and. Uh, parenthood. The stories really opened my eye because I realized that there are lots of hurdles that this woman and the family needs to go through that non-disabled people don't have to. I am also thinking about being a mother, and this is difficult decision for me to make already. By creating Mia, I would like to tackle this issue of learning disabled people's parenthood head on rather than beating around the bushes. Hey, my name is Anna Gray. I mean, I've been at Mia for five years now, and it's my first mental drawing of Mia. I think Mia is important because it does give some insight into the challenges learning disabled parents can face, which most parents, not being disabled in the first place, wouldn't even know existed. Which also just shows with the positive things. I think it's been a bit useful for me because it actually says how big a challenge I work, may have should I have a child. All they would like to have a family. Just because they've got a disability doesn't mean that they can't have sex and have a family one day. So Mia is the fast-moving contemporary performance. So in it, you wouldn't find the conventional beginning, middle, and end, or a single narrative, or one character that follows all the way through. My favorite part of the show is the game show. I get to have a little make people laugh and be silly. It is episodic. It is fast-moving and raw. At the end, we realise we've joined a roller coaster. So hopefully, you can come and join the ride. Oh dear. 
Oops, hold on, we'll get that off. <laughs> right, sorry, getting back to it. So, I, I, sorry, did you get the whole gist of that? I didn't really spoil it for you, did I? I mean, it's a big subject and it's been talked about from the learning disability community now because of the sort of structures we've got in um, the UK. Some councils will actually put support in place for disabled uh, learn disabled families or women or men to be able to continue looking after the child and things but others just would take them off them automatically um there's a lot of intervention into down syndrome babies i don't know if you're aware in iceland there's not been a down syndrome baby born there for the last seven years and um, other countries it's the same and yet when you can see the richness of what people are as humans no matter where they are in their intellect or the way they uh, they are in life our value system doesn't value people who don't think uh, that academic way who can't go through school in those sort of ways some of the political words that people use are around the fact that that um this they have learning difficulties or learning disabilities deliberately putting it into an education context and it's they're, they're not the one with learning disabilities, really. It's just the learning disables them because they're not being taught a way that can really help them reach their potential. We've got a long way to go. But one of the things I really wanted to look at at last year's DataFest was this issue around learning disabled people being seen as sexual people, being seen as mothers and fathers, and being able to be families. And we got a group together of, of people and it was really heartbreaking because people were saying they were serialized as a child. Other people were told, um, were given genetic counseling to be told never to be parents. It wouldn't be fair because they're bound to continue that particular um, condition. So those sort of Darwinian eugenicist theories are still there in our education system, particularly poignant to young disabled people. A number of, friend of my, uh, friends of mine who've been through the segregated schooling system, we don't call it special when we're working in disability arts because it really isn't setting people up to become contributing members of society. They are all automatically given genetic counselling at the age of 14 and 15 um, about their impairments and whether they will continue it with their children. What kid of 14 and 15 wants to talk about that? You know, I, I don't really know that many 14, 50 years who want to go, I'm going to have a child. Oh, yeah. They, they just don't. They're thinking about other things, their clothes, their boyfriend, their girlfriend or whatever. But that sort of pressure is put on people an awful lot within the structures that we have. We don't support people, particularly people to be mothers. And oh, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue because there's so many stories I know, but I've not seen the art. And I feel doing this talk and thinking it through is made me think I've got to do something about it. So this talk for me is the first way of looking at, at these things. I'm going to go back to the shared screen um, because I want to complete the, the PowerPoint, if you don't mind. Um, so we had Mia. I want to finish with this one. This is great. I don't know if any of you have ever come across this piece of work. It's actually called Bad Mummy. It's a disabled woman with spikes and leather. And it's to actually show we don't have to fit into this nice, caring, lovely image as mummies. We can be radical and we can have different bodies. Obviously, we need to keep the head <laughs> because I don't think we can function without our head. But I was really pleased to bring this piece of work into DataFest in 2012 through an exhibition called Neat Normal. Um, it's called Neat Normal because it's Dutch. And in uh, the Netherlands, which is an ironically contradictory country, um, I'll explain why in a moment, um, but neat normal, if you say neat normal, which obviously in English is not normal, it actually means cool, you're different, you're brilliant, you're neat normal. And in our society, it's like if you say you're not normal, you bound to get a bit of a comeback what we did is to open this exhibition there's all sorts of things in in the exhibition it was, it was a really great one to do um i, I Anna givers who's the actual curator i put her link in a paper you're going to get soon um what we did in liverpool at the opening of the exhibition the um it was brilliant because um 
we had a, fa a train service, Virgin train service, like Virgin train uh, planes. They gave us a first class um, carriage from London with all of the, the reviewers and the publicity people and the key people in the arts to come up and meet us at our station in Lime Street in Liverpool. And um, what we had is lots of disabled people in abnormal or something else it was fascinating um, and then we analyzed the results the scariest thing for me most men said they were normal about that and I absolutely no problem at all women most women said they were subnormal or abnormal and I thought what a, what is that saying about the way women are portrayed in our media today we don't get the positive role models. So if women who aren't mainly disabled women are feeling that, can you imagine how much more impacting it is on disabled people um, to want to be parents? I'm gonna leave you with this before I just finish with a bit of a talk. At the end of the day, we can endure much more than we think we can from Frida Kylo. And I think we can, and we don't want people to keep telling us we can't be mothers, we can't be, um, we can't let, look after people. We can. We can be everything if society doesn't put all those pressures on us. So it was really interesting for me to start to unpick it and realise in all the disability arts examples, I could throw loads of stuff at you, but I wasn't seeing the mothering com uh, conversations. And I really want to see that. I, I really am thrilled about Mind the Gap because that, that came about because the girl they were talking about who was pregnant, she was having to go through a almost a, an exam, being given a doll, show us how you change this nappy. Do you understand what this means? Can you boil milk? Do you, just because she had learning difficulties, she was expected to not understand all of this stuff. And it's scary actually that we have those systems in place in the UK. I'm not sure what happens in the States or if it changes from, from state to state, but well done for um, Minor Gaff making a big piece of theatre about it. They do workshops as well. And um, it's not just for disabled people. We have many non-disabled people going to see their work. But one of the things I love is they do a lot of workshops from the actors with learning disabled people about sexual um, activity and what equipment they can use and you know they can be gay there's they can be trans they can be anything but people still see learning disabled people particularly as not really grown up and we have to really change some of that thinking and disability arts does that so coming back to the original start of the thing to me Mia is about empowerment because it told a strong story and it made people sit up and think and that conversation is still ongoing. All righty, so I've kind of come to the end of my presentation. I just want to try and get some conversation going on, people. Um, I'm sorry we had some technical hiccups, but um, I do appreciate you listening and letting me go through it. But has anyone even got examples of, of art, of that they may have seen um, disabled women creating art about motherhood or men creating art about motherhood and fatherhood. Any examples anyone can share in the room? <clears throat> no? Because I, I know Fran's been looking at this in lots of ways. I mean, when she came to stay with me, which was wonderful, she came to Liverpool well before I met the man I'm now married to with a, a 3D sculpture of breast milk. It was wonderful <laughs> to have that. And I, I show it practically to everyone who comes to stay. <laughs> well, they can't stay at the moment because of, of COVID. But as someone, I, I breastfed my babies and I had so much milk. I actually, my first, a second child, I actually breastfed seven other babies because I was just like, it was just a joy for me to be. I'll, but those sort of things just don't get talked about. And disabled women it's it's a it's there's so many taboos around all these sort of things so has anyone got anything that they feel they want to share or any observations i no yes amy i'm going to pin you okay so i can oh, see no. you. don't pin me yeah that's great thank you 
I have a question just, you know, thinking about um, the context of the interventions for learning disabled and for an experience that you had when you were pregnant. Um, and to think that Iceland hasn't had um, a person with Down syndrome uh, born in the past seven years is astonishing. Um, and just thinking about the history of sterilization and of, you know, population control and eugenics. And, and I was trying to like frame that within like kind of US um, medical, like reproductive context. And um, because I've never, uh, you know, I have two children, but I never uh, had any kind of encounters uh, like that uh, with medical personnel. But given how restrictive abortion is and reproductive rights are in the U.S., um, I'm not sure. I I, could, I couldn't tell you if that's something that happens. Um, I imagine it, if it did, it would be determined by state, state to state, because of laws. But at this point, there are some states where there's one abortion clinic in the whole state. Um, so I, I don't know. That was just uh, just something that that uh, from like a cultural comparison standpoint um, is just. Uh, you know, something that, that really, I think, opened my eyes um, thinking about that. It, it is, um, I'm going to just change the gallery view. It's a big, big issue because it, it's so different depending on the countries you're in and things and, and what people will say about it. Um, the UK, our National Health Service is brilliant, but when it comes to some of these issues, it's terrible. Um, I, I've had to fight. The first child I had to fight because I didn't want any drugs. I wanted the umbilical cord left on until he was breathing on his own. Um, I didn't want to be shaved. I didn't want to be cut. All these is that you can't take charge of your body. We're in charge of your body. Um, but I had another child four years later. It was a totally different situation. And she was born at home by accident, but it went really well, um, really different. But they wouldn't let me, they didn't want me to do a home birth, they wanted to, and we ended up doing it by accident, really, honestly, because they thought I was a risk and they wanted me in hospital. Um, and I don't know what that risk they really thought was. So it was quite interesting whether it was because I was there for whatever, I don't know. But my last child, because I was 39, 40, I was told again, not as hard as with Alex as, you know, you'd be irresponsible, but, you know, you should know because, you know, if you have a Down's baby, you, you've got that age, you, you could. Um, it's, it's quite, it, the intervention in that is quite awful for women because we have it at so many levels, whether we can be sexual, whether we can um, have children or not have children, the choices that is on us as women. And then when you impound it with some of the issues around learning disability and other disabled people and deaf women, um, how they don't maybe get a signer to help them when they're giving birth and things. So there's all those sort of things that people don't think about are there. Uh, I've, it's quite funny, my friend um, Lawrence and his wife have both got cerebral palsy and they wanted children. And the very first time, because of the way her hips are shaped with her cerebral palsy, they said, you can't give a nat nat birth naturally. You're going to have to have a cesarean. And, and Lawrence, well, I want to be there. It's going to be an epidural. And um, they were all cleared up for it. And then they said, oh, no, you can't come in in your wheelchair, Lawrence. And he went, but the bed's got wheels. What's the difference? <laughs> you know, just clean the wheels. Um, I mean, he, he really, he, he was bolshy and he fought it. But I think when you live through life as disabled people, the reason disability arts is so important about empowering is that your voice gets ignored time and time again. Not just ignore, put down, you can't, you're not able to. And that's the, the, the kind of story I had was, I can't, I'm not able to. I, having a child was for me the biggest, biggest change and I'm allowed to like, be alive. And I, I thought, and I, that motherhood experience that it really made me but other people don't want children it doesn't matter but that we have all sorts of different things if you're disabled and you don't want children it's fine but if you're not disabled like my daughter um she's a brilliant beautiful palace performer she's also deaf um she just does not want children and but people don't because she has a hidden impairment they're not they don't really know she's deaf but she's always having to deal with the fact that she's not having children, particularly of 
people of a certain generation. Have any of you ever come across those sort of kind of pressures on you as women? It's horrendous, isn't it? You know, but then if you really want to have women, uh, babies and be a mum or a dad, as disabled people, and Lawrence and, and Adele, they were, um, Lawrence has been one of the dad of best successes. Um, he's gone on to, he's now writing big productions for television over in, in the UK and things. The BBC followed them having their last baby to do an, uh, a documentary. And that's the other thing, you do see disabled women in documentaries having babies, uh, but we're not seeing art, <laughs> that's a big thing. But Lawrence and Adele, they said it's gonna be a six part series, but because Lawrence and Adele were so activistic and saying the right thing and not allowing them to, to, to treat them badly um, whilst they're going through this whole experience, they made it one episode and they called it against their wishes we won't just drop the baby, um, which was just awful because everyone thinks as them as people with cerebral palsy are going to drop the baby. It was just, I mean, Lawrence has a whole comedy show about it and how uh, the NHS has treated him as a father, um, an irresponsible father. And um, he says at the end of it, well, we did, we dropped the babies all the time. <laughs> you know, it's just, but every baby gets dropped. I mean, I'm a mum, I've dropped all three of mine at some point. It's just it's part of it. They bounce. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a bit naughty now. But, you know, there's things that we just got to, we want to just live and do the things that the people that let us do. And the, the arts can be that real tool for empowerment. And, I want to see more mother stories, father stories, having children stories. Um, I actually got in touch with all my kids before this and I went, I just want to thank you all for making me a mum and I'm so proud of you. And um, I really feel I want to do more with them about their lives and that having to fight with Alex and, and go against the system. Because as soon as I stood up and said, I don't think you should have killed me, I really was treated quite badly then. I had things written on my reports and things, and that's our NHS for you. But um, it got better with the next pregnancy. But yeah, yeah, Fran. I mean, I'd like um, to also look at it from the angle, um, different sort of angles um, in terms of intersectionality, as well as what happens to women during pregnancy, during childbirth and postpartum, that um, we have this stigma here in the United States of women having to be capable of doing it all. Mm. We're supposed to have jobs, have babies, have clean houses, um, and pack little lunches for our children with hearts and notes. And I mean, we have this idea of a June Cleaver, which is a 1950s actress from Leave it to Beaver. Um, and that we neglect, I think we intentionally try to play down women's disabilities. Um, <laughs> Yes, they never, it's true. I just cleaned our toilet today. And I'm like, why should I be cleaning this toilet? I'm not the one who pees standing up. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I think that we have a culture also of, of sort of portraying women as this, you know, this is your duty. Your duty is to get pregnant have children and do this afterwards and do it in a certain is in a certain way um and i think that's very intersectional with because it goes to what your past is how you live lived your life whether you're you know a deaf woman or a hearing person or anything it just goes to if you don't if you're not uh, uh up to par then you will perform poorly during pregnancy birth and postpartum and I think there's a deep intersectionality with that and the mortality of black mothers in the United States. Black mm -hmm. mothers have the highest mortality rates in the United States. And I think that um, that plays a really big part of it. The way we're, um, mm -hmm. we have this idea of women and um, disabilities and race. So all of that, I'm, you know, in my work, I do like these branches. I do the motherhood branch. I do the disability arts branch and I do the race and immigration branch 
diasporic branches. And as I'm doing all of these things separately, I'm realizing they're more and more coming together to form something else. And um, I, I just think that that might, in, the, in talking about the missing link as well, because if we see it like post, right? after the birth and things like that. We're like, okay, why aren't mothers making more art? Why aren't more disabled mothers making more art? Mm -hmm. And really it's, the question should be, why aren't we supporting mm -hmm. disabled mothers to make more art? Yeah. Yeah. Or mothers in general, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that, I think that's the more, mm. uh, I don't know. I'm no. just talking now. No. It's fine. What, what you're saying is really quite important because it is those pressures put on people. And I, I, I don't know if you felt this, Van, but I've always tried to do more to prove myself because I felt I had to, because I was so written off as a child. Um, I, I didn't get into the arts till after Alex was born. See, Alex was absolutely the catalyst for change for me. A, I'm allowed to be alive and care for someone. And then I went to a dance class to get fit because I was so overweight and found I could do all these amazing things with my body. I did the splits for the first time in my life and put my leg up here and all sorts of things. Then I went to drama school and I found my place um, where I could really flourish and be. And, um, and then I, having the next child when I was still at the, the theatre school was quite interesting. I'd just gone on to point in my dance when I was pregnant with six months pregnant doing that. It was quite fun actually, I was very thin then. But, um, but that thing of, yeah, even though we can have support of people around us, there's always that limit, that thing about saying about men never being toilets. It really is true. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I, it, we, we kind of because we have to think that way we're almost forced into those sort of cleaning up jobs all the time but there's loads of big questions going out here i know but it's coming back to our right as disabled women to be women and mothers to stay as artists i do know a lot of artists who are not disabled who give up their art because they're women and they can't do it all and they know they don't get the help um, and it, that was one of the things that was going through my mind. I was looking at all the art examples, how many women had started to do something and then they've gone off and they may come back 20, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't happen. You know, we yeah. should keep yeah. us in there. Why do we see that we've got to become that caregiver in that, that big way? I mean, it's hard because we're all dealing with austerity as well, which is putting more pressures on the family unit to look after older parents as well. And um, if you've got a disabled child, if you're disabled, you know, all those sort of pressures are out there. Um, but I think what the problem is, is we don't know how to articulate it. We don't feel we can articulate it. We internalize it, which is why I want to see more art coming from this place. Disability art about being mums, about being dads, about those sorts of pressures. Um, there's a few people who do it, but you can see that they're not where they, they can be because of it. And that really breaks my heart for people because we all want to have that share in life and do our big things. and but sometimes we have to sacrifice more than we should for our children, you know, those choices that we can make. If we can make them, some of us are not even allowed to make them. You know, that's what's, that's my heart. Gosh, it feels a bit <laughs> downer now, <laughs> but. Mm. I, I also think we don't provide enough venues for disability artists, uh, uh, disabled artists or making dis disability arts in general. It's not, like you said, it's not perceived as something that is, um, there's still a stigma to it. And I think that institutions, um, as far as I know, you know, there's two main institutions that I know that do, uh, do host and um, keep it in their programming, RIT, uh, Dyer Art Center at Rochester Institute um, in New York. They have, a, where National Institute for the Deaf is they have a gallery there dedicated to deaf art. 
And the other one is in Berkeley in California. They have their disabled arts program there. You know, Sunny Taylor is teaching there now. Oh, yeah. she's a great example, actually. Yes. yes. I don't know how she, she's managing because she, I got her to Dada Fest one year before a child came along so um yes you've got someone there you can be looking carrie sounds on as well you know she's adopted two children she's phenomenal and she's done it as an academic she was actually in the very first ugly girl show we did in 2012 and came over to uh, liverpool to work on that yeah that, yeah we've got to support those who are making it and and mm -hmm. see where people are at with their choices and the, one of the great things about being sisters <laughs> is that we can help support one another to get mm -hmm. to those places. Um, I love my job now. I'm not creating as much art. And in one way that feel, makes me feel sad, but my job is about making others create art. And I keep doing that. And I can't say to people, if you've got children, we'll pay for childcare. We'll put that into our access budgets. So you are not excluded from this. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. often we just don't ask. And we need to find ways of asking mm -hmm. and making sure people don't internalise it too much. And that's why I think doing this sort of art is so important because it gives a voice. It reflects reality um, of the truth of reality of disability, not the documentaries, not the, the silly mm -hmm. stereotypes we often see with forest gumps and all this sort of stuff. The truth of what it is to be disabled and live in the world together. Anyway... I I find for myself as a deaf disabled woman um, in the art world, the difficulties for me are in finding venues, right? And um, uh, being granted some uh, funding to create my work because I am who I am. I still have my children. I'm a mother and I do this and I have my job and all these things. But to be able to have, I was just telling my friend today, I, I just wish I had one whole week just to myself to be able to finish this series of paintings that I'm making, right? And that is not available to me because one, most of the funding that are there for residencies or whatever it is for artists, are not directed towards mothers who have children and now grandmothers, right? Who have extended family, who take care of, of, of grandchildren and all of these things. Um, uh, and the other thing is that, that it's inaccessible to those of us, us and, and Amy will back me up on this. There's all these opportunities out there for women artists, disabled artists to be able to apply for funding, but the application process is not just not accessible, not attainable for people who have this life, our That's lives. It. And so I think in terms of that, you know, because I hear this argument all the time from experts in grant funding and things like who's like, well, these are all available for you. Okay, well, as a disabled woman who's deaf and has three children and has a grandchild, right, and you know, 56 year old boy. <laughs> you do <laughs> he's, he's gone. He's gone. He went to go pick up Sean <laughs> from college. So, um, you know, that, that, yes, I would love to apply for all these things, but I don't have 20 hours to sit down and fabricate this incredible application. Mm. And in, and I do not have the experience to list down like my contemporaries who are men who are not disabled and who don't have children. Mm -hmm. So you put people like that in the same application process, you already have this huge inequity of mm -hmm. what's going on. Um, because we don't count women's labor, mm -hmm. childcare as part of, you know, experience in our life experience when truly those of us who you and I who are cultural producers are able to do this yeah. with dragging our children along yeah. in in that sense we should actually you know contemporary to men people should be looking at as and say like wow you're you're really awesome or you know you're you yeah that guy couldn't do it 
<laughs> couldn't got walk so around. much you've got to do. And one thing I just want to say, you've seen in the back of me, I've got We Shall Not Be Removed. It's a UK Alliance of Disability Artists now who are challenging what's going on with COVID because we have a big subsidised funding system in the UK. And there's actually a lot of people who are starting to exclude disabled people from coming back into opening things in the art sector. Um, people who are shielding like me um, have been seen as a health risk, so people are, are not being invited into casts if they're in, were part of a theatre production, things like that. So we have actually got some big issues uh, we're fighting for, and we shall not be removed, is one of the big things we're, we're moving on together. But Going back to the original point of the whole conversation is we need more disability arts from women, from men about parenthood and motherhood and all of that. And we just don't seem to have it. And it's like it's a hidden thing. And we not, we've got to stop hiding it. Um, so it's trying to make those conversations. Anyway, I'm aware it's after your time. I'm sorry I didn't have a um a captioner to be able to get more of your questions and things but there's loads in there in the, the chat room so thank you for that and um, there is a, a couple of documents i've put in there for you one is called non-disability privilege um are you probably all aware of the um white privilege stuff that's going on it's a sort of a, i plagiarized that in a way it was a public document originally but it just gives you a, a, an idea of how missing we are in society if you fill that in well not fill it in just use it and yes or no but the other is lots and lots of links some papers some films to watch but some of the artists have featured it today uh, you may enjoy getting a bit more information about but thank you so much for inviting me it I really, it oh, made I, sense. and i hope you get over to pittsburgh again before too long <laughs> Ruth, can I ask you one last question? And I also, anybody who else wants to ask a closing question, please feel free yeah. to just hop in. Um, yeah. But I wanted to ask you as, you know, you were going through your presentation, um, and I think, as you had mentioned, like a, a critical part of this is like just the, the ways in which education and the institutions and mechanisms of education can um, inculcate, indoctrinate, yeah. or help. Um, it, and I guess I, I was going to ask you in terms of like tactical strategies, at, I am an educator, I'm teaching a class on decolonizing contemporary art next semester. How do I bring in disability arts and how, sh like how the framing of it too is coming from someone who doesn't identify as, as having a disability. I'm making sure that, that my language and my terminology and the way that I approach the material um is i don't know if you have any kind of i know it's kind of a big question but i just it is a big one because one of the things that i feel about disability arts is it's very um it's very shaped by the context of the country it comes from because there's so many different social strata that disable different people and their placing can be very different um i mean i i I, I've been able to travel a lot and i did a big uh, winston churchill research piece on the empowerment of disability because a lot of places like Africa and India organizations were getting in touch with me who wanted to work with disabled people and the arts, not disability arts. And you get a lot of gatekeepers like that. And it's like, I wanted to research where are the voices? Is it coming from disabled people themselves? And you see some countries it is, some they are so oppressed and put down and not necessarily countries where you think. I was in Finland. And I was shocked that I was on a big um, stage with lots and lots of producers in the art. And there were two disabled people on that stage. I think it was about 15 of us. And I was one and the other was Carrie Sandal. And they were talking about art, disability arts. And they all said, we never know any disabled people in power in Finland. And then this young woman came to speak to me and Carrie afterwards, she's a wheelchair user. And she said, we get pensioned off when we're 16. We're told not to go for jobs, we're not told to go to universities, they give us a flat, they give us a pension, type of equivalent, and we're happy, we're looked at, them, but we want to take part in society, and they don't allow us. And it was really interesting hearing it from that sort of culture. And then I go somewhere like um, Malaysia, DR Congo, and seeing these incredible groups of disabled and deaf people just doing art. As my, one of my most favourite was um, a whole group in, I've probably gone off kilter a bit there, but I'll come back and 
really antsy in the moment was um, a deaf group and they were digging sewers in the na- in the day and they were frying eggs on the, the road to, to sell to get money and then in the evening they were artists because they did theatre together and they were they were brilliant and um, it really threw me about how we say we can only be artists or this if we've gone through this sort of training or this sort of experiences but it's almost an attitude I'm an artist I'm an activist I'm a this you know we, we can claim those but I think Disability arts mean so many different things to different countries. The UK has really sort of promoted it because we have a fantastic art support system, subsidised arts, which realised they weren't getting disabled people involved, not as audiences. Um, that was something that was dealt with years ago. So we have lots of accessible places and um, audio described performance and sign performances, all sorts of different things. But we are getting the artists and now we get the artists and the support in place for that. So there's a lot of websites you can look at the Disability Arts UK, um, but it would be good to try and find it where you are. Mm-hmm. Who are the disabled people in your locality, your community? Because I really think young people need to be, be have role models. People they can see, oh, they can do that. One of the things about putting kids into segregated school at an early age is we've created this STEM and us for disabled people. It's not ordinary every day. And that's one of the crimes I think around segregated education. I know some people need more support, but in the UK, they'll have two support workers working with them in the school. Um, so th- there are different things that are different schools and um, places will do. But disability arts, I've given you two different definitions there. I don't think it'll ever be fixed because it moves with society. And I'm seeing now more non-disabled people doing disability arts, like Mark Quinn and Alison Lapper working together. She's a brilliant artist in her own right. She I put a le- website link in the paper. She does a work with a mouth and a brush and it's brilliant work she does. And she does, she goes into schools and does workshops with kids and teaches them how to do art. And it's fantastic because it's breaking the taboos all the time about what disabled and non-disabled people can do. But we have to be careful. We had a real problem with the Olympics in 2012 where disabled people had a major moment. And there has been a change about how disabled people are seen in the common media of the country because there was so much promotion about it. But it's now had a backlash because hate crime is on the rise because people think disabled people can do anything. They all want to be Paralympians and fly across the, the roof or whatever. Whereas they're athletes, the Paralympians. <laughs> they're very talented, skilled, dedicated sports people. But that's not said. It's all, aren't they amazing? Because they can do that with two no legs. And that conversation's got to change, you know, because our life can change any moment. That's the thing about disability. It cuts through everything, every age, every background, every... I mean, there's a lot of incidences in, in uh, low socioeconomic communities, but it, it can happen to anyone at any time. And it will happen to us all eventually. So I really want to get the conversation happening earlier. So we don't have- I, I think, else. sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I think also um, the culture here in the United States toward disability is very, very set and really hard to shake that mold out. Um, mm-hmm. Last year, we had an incident um, where drag, was it last year, two years ago, Ruth, where drag syndrome, this this uh, company this, uh, mm-hmm. of yeah. uh, the, oh, the yeah. artists have Down syndrome and they dress and they do this drag show, very much like what you see in like, you know, the under New York underground drag scene. And they were banned from performing in, in rally in rally because um you know, because of the way the conservative mm-hmm. government is right now and so um they had an alternative venue and they eventually and i and i think they were able to perform in a very very small scale but they were not able to perform in the um the the original venue the large original venue where they were supposed to be performed they were canceled like last minute when uh, the owner of the building who happened to also be seeking political office saw the programming of that day and he kind of put the kibosh on it and said oh no you guys can't do this so you know we we all through the lived experiment where i put an exhibition together in liverpool that went to grand rapids into the three galleries oh 
and they got the funding because everyone thought, oh, disability arts would be nice. But actually what they didn't realise is there's a lot of subversion and in-your-face challenges in the way the work was being created. And it was almost like disability arts just done like a Trojan horse. You know, it's like, oh, disability, nice. And, and the sponsors, oh, nice, yes. But the creators were going, yes, we can get really risque work here. And I thought, isn't that interesting <laughs> that you can do that with disability arts? But yeah, it, it, it's it's uncomfortable for people because they don't like people who are who are really selling out the truth, and that's really hard. I mean, you can have Down syndrome and be gay and be trans and to be into drag and to be mothers and to be fathers, but we don't allow that to happen. You know, it's not nice. So we got, I mean, we still have ugly laws. Because <laughs> yeah. we put all these sorts of social things on there. Sorry, I've not given you very clear for answer there, but it's a big thing. Mm, yeah. I, anyway. Although, Amy, I do think if you look into the history of disability in the United States, you'll see a lot of art that we don't classify right now as fine art because, well, they were probably made by disabled people. And so it's not been put in that category yet. Right. But, you know, like, for example, immigrants coming into Ellis Island who had some sort of um, deficiency, they called it, that were turned back and deported. I mean, I read this story once of a man who was, you know, had lived in the United States for two years, gone back to Italy to give some money to his family, came back and they had, uh, they had evaluated him and he was turned away because his penis was too small and they were deemed, yeah, and they were deemed as defective. And so, you know, there's a lot of work about those types of incidents that are that exist, but we don't recognize them as like art, art, or a particular. I would artist. like to go to their airport security. This <laughs> <laughs> um, was like, in nineteen what nineteen twenty eight or yeah, something. Yeah, when Ellis like Island was still open, <laughs> yeah. there was no X ray machine. No, no, there wasn't machine. that thing where you stand in the right. And in fact, they <laughs> in in. Yeah. The entrance to Ellis Island, they almost they had what was like a almost like a an obstacle course mm -hmm. for people to go through, so mm -hmm. that the immigration attorneys would just look at it, and you oh. see if they mm -hmm. see people fumbling, they're like, okay, you're gonna get flagged, mm -hmm. and you're gonna be we're gonna test you more to see if you're deficient or not, if we can mm -hmm. let you in the country. So if you think about the design of that as you know almost like a piece of art, this obstacle course. I mean, there are those things that exist mm. as um, art pieces. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, but if you're gonna look for like disabled artists, I mean, there's a book about that uh, artist, but, you know. A, yeah, a big diff difference between art and disabled people and disabled people doing art to disability art, because disability art is actually, it's intention to capture the lived experience of disability. Mm. Um, so a lot of people think if you're disabled and doing art, it must be disability art. It's not. It's not a disability. It's, it's very different. It's not disability art. So um, there's a lot. Anyway, people are needing to go. There's papers in the uh, being sent to you by email from Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sorting out the room and everything, and um, for your bearing with me with all the technical hiccups. So try. I thought I was going to get it really smooth. It. It was very oh, smooth. Nice. The trust, trust it. Very smooth. <laughs> I can send you the um, the PowerPoint if you want. I'm not precious on these things. Okay. That would be great because that also just a great examples of artists to to dive into and look at more. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. And, Ruth, um, you want to stick around before you hang up so we can uh, square things away. So thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate you bearing with us through all the technical difficulties. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you. Great okay. to see you all. Love to see you again, Tiffany. Bye. Bye. And Bye. Susan Powers, who's part of the Anthropology of Motherhood exhibit currently. Thank you so much for being with us. Mm -hmm.